många här jobbar med marknadsföring? Kan man se någonting? Några stycken. Hur många jobbar med försäljning? Kan ni räcka upp en hand, tack. Och hur många av er har någon form av ledarskapsposition? Räcka upp en hand. Och hur många här inne har inte fått räcka upp en hand överhuvudtaget än? <laughs> Två personer. Innan jag sätter igång så vill jag börja med att lova er en sak. För hur många här inne har mycket att göra? Det är 2017 och det händer grejer, eller hur? Och det är inte självklart att ta en hel dag för att lära sig en massa saker och att komma till en ny nivå. Och det som är grejen, det är att det sätter press på oss som är här att verkligen leverera värde. Och jag lovar att jag ska leverera värde på två grejer till er. Den första grejen det är att vi ska ju prata om det här. How to win bigger deals smarter. Och ni kommer känna att varför, varför är det här viktigt? Ni kommer känna det i hela alla era celler i kroppen. Det andra som ni kommer att känna det är att ni har en tydlig plan. För att hur många inne har varit på ett inspirationsföreläsning någon gång när man kommer därifrån och känner sig superpeppad men man vet inte riktigt vad man ska göra av grejerna? Det har väl alla varit. Men grejen är ju det att man behöver ju göra saker för att få nya resultat. Och det är det vi ska göra här så att det blir väldigt konkret. Och jag hoppas att det är okej okay att jag berättar ett par ord om mig själv och min bakgrund innan vi kommer in i alla detaljer. Är det okej? Okay? Tack så mycket. Och jag hade en fantastisk uppväxt ända tills jag var ja, ungefär sju år gammal. För att min första dag i skolan, den började väldigt, väldigt dåligt. Nej, men det var så att hela mitt liv blev ett ganska stort helvete. Under inte bara det året, utan under åtta år. Och det som var grejen som, som hände det var det att jag började ställa mig själv frågor. Som var, vad är det för fel på mig? Och hjärnan funkar ju så, så att om man ställer en fråga så får man ju ett svar. Om man ställer en väldigt dålig fråga så får man väldigt dåliga svar. Eh, och för mig så blev det här ett stort problem. Och jag började ställa nya frågor. Och de här frågorna var istället, vad är meningen med livet? Är det någon mening med att leva eller är det bättre att dö? Och... Välkommen till den här positiva föreläsningen, förresten. <laughs> och det finns en poäng med det här. Det som hände var att jag fattade ett beslut. Och jag undrar, förresten, för jag skulle gärna vilja utmana mig själv och köra på engelska. Skulle det vara okej okay för er att jag körde på engelska? För jag vet att det är några engelska människor i publiken som jag gärna vill ska höra här. Är det okej? Okay? Okej, okay, thank you. So, what happened was that I made a decision. I had enough. Anyone here ever had enough? Broke up, fired someone, got fired maybe, quit. And I said no more. And I never went back. The problem what happened was, instead of feeling very bad and not getting any results, I continued having this war inside me, but I was getting these amazing results. And the more the more i worked the more results i got the problem was that i was super unhappy inside what happened was i had the possibility to meet a lot of super successful people and i noticed the same pattern and i know that in this audience with a lot of sales people and a lot of management it's going to be the same that outside everything is perfect but inside there is things there are things happening because Including me, I was driven by the certainty that I had significance, that I was good enough. And after about 10 years of feeling that, I had enough again. And this time I thought, as my mentor would say, isn't it better to happily achieve than to achieve to be happy? Who thinks that's better? Please raise your hand. Thank you. And the reason why I'm sharing this is because how many here has ever made a decision? Raise your hand. And how many have then after that not done what you promised? Raise your hand, please. 
<laughs> and how many have done that several times? <laughs> and how many feel intelligent? Raise your hand, please. <laughs> so it's not what we do. It's not how we do it. It's why we do it. And that's super important. So the things that we are going to talk about here, it's what Michael said. It's the most important important things to become successful in business to business. Try to find a hyper successful B2B company in Sweden that doesn't do this. So the first, I want you to take a friend, your colleague or neighbor, and in a moment give them a high five, and we're going to do a short exercise. Why is this transformational for you? Because if you don't have a strong why, you won't change. I never went back because I had a super strong why. And you know when you've made a decision and you've changed permanently, there was a strong why. So find the hell over here and discuss that with your friend. And find the heaven over here and discuss that with your friend as well so you know you have the why. So please give them a high five and start the exercise now. Thank you. So, we have a model at Next State, uh, and it's in Swedish, and it started out as the 3K model. And then we understood that that means KKK, and that wasn't a very good idea. <laughs> and then it became the 6K model, and then in Swedish, as you know, six is pronounced sex. So it was the 6K model, which was not very smart at all. <laughs> So we changed it to the 7K model and then we gave up because that became the sick model. So, in English, and I know that some of you won't see this, so write it down if you need. It's just our kick-ass method of best practices of how to win bigger deals smarter. And it starts with the ideal client, who you're targeting. It goes on to the buying logic because a lot of sales is going to be automated. Gartner says that millions and millions and millions and millions of salespeople, they will be out of a job and because of automation. And that's part of sales. The other part, which is how to win bigger deals smarter, that part is going to be more complex. We have the buying process, which is also interesting where do I need to target the client when they are buying now or early in the process? Many people miss that and we're going to go into depth here, here. And then if we have time, we're going to go through the client plan, which is also one of the most important things that everyone miss. Final parts are client life cycle. We are born, we have a life and we die, right? Simplification, but true. A uh, client life cycle is the same, but a client relationship, if it's aging, you can still revitalize it through the right tools and best practices. And channels, it doesn't matter if it's social selling, if it's cold calling, if it's account-based marketing or whatever it is, we need to reach our client to get the results. And it's just the different ways of reaching the clients. So this is our model, and I want to start with this which is the ideal client. So I have a friend, her name is Aurora. Aurora, 30 years ago, she went to Italy. She met Franco, they fell in love. Anyone in here ever been in love? <laughs> Anyone can make the sound of love? No, not in this room. <laughs> so they really hit it off. So they moved back to from where Aurora is from in Australia, and they started a company. The problem was that Franco didn't speak a word of English, so they started a cleaning company. That was 30 years ago. Now they have $120 million in revenue and 3,000 employees. So basically 3,000 families are dependent on Aurora and Franco. And me and Aurora, we are having lunch, and she said, I want to take my business from 120 million to 240 million and to 360 million. The problem was 
that she was confused. She said, I'm confused. I don't know what to do. There are so many experts and people saying different things. It's everything from account-based marketing to marketing automation uh, to inbound marketing to challenger sales, spin selling, solution sales. There's so many buzzwords. Anyone heard any of these buzzwords? Yeah, of course. And she said, I'm confused. So we stepped into Johan's nice area of common sense, the common sense corner. And I asked her, how many clients produce the majority of these 120 million? She said, seven. Wow. Seven is 95% of the revenue. Okay. And if you want to go from here to here, how many potential clients are there? There are 30 to go to here. And I asked her, of these 120, how many people make the decision? How many are decision makers? She said, there are five core decision makers per company in general, but total of 30 decision makers and influencers. And this is the interesting part. So she has 210 people helping providing for 3,000 families, right? And here, there are 30 people per company that was influencers and decision makers as well. So 900 people here, 210 pe people here, so a total of 1,110 people, right? And then the interesting question that no one answers yes for. I asked Aurora, do you have the name of all these 1,110 people? Do you have their email addresses, their LinkedIn address, their mobile phone number? Do you know their professional needs, their personal interests? And do you have a consistent marketing and sales effort towards these? And she said, of course, no. How many here has that type of sales and marketing effort down on an individual level toward their clients? Please raise their hand. So it's three people. Nice. <laughs> so this is the problem. And then some people, they say to me, Johan, I want to spread my risks. The problem with that is if you don't do this first and you have 3,000 people dependent on 210 people, what will happen? You might lose a few of these clients and then you're basically fucked. So we want to start here. The next exercise is, therefore, to discuss how the... 80-20 principle applies to your company and give your friend again a high five and start discussing. Apply the 80-20 principle. How detailed is your knowledge about your most important key clients on an individual level? Do you have company name, name, title, LinkedIn profile, etc.? You get the point. You're welcome to discuss. Is this valuable so far? Please raise your hand. How many think it sucks? Four people, thank you, <laughs> that you're honest. So before we continue, I want to share 30 sec seconds about the book uh, that Michael told you about, guys about. Uh, me and my friend Christopher Engman, we're writing a book called Mega Deals, where we interview, well, the people that make the largest deals in the world. And we have a person, a full-time researcher that is going to be able to scientifically validate and prove one important fact. To become a hyper-successful business-to-business company, you need to do larger deals. And then you might think, well, I'm not going to do a $2 billion deal. By the way, the guy that did the largest deal or the team was $4.8 billion so far. I don't think he has a problem with his sales commission. So this is, this is the thing, if you, if you go to the more transactional selling and the small deals, you're going to be automated. Anyone here has ever gone on an Uber ride? Yeah. What happens to the Uber drivers when there are automated cars? Anyone a guess? There won't be any Uber drivers. And this is, this is the same thing, and this has been starting to happen in sales as well. It's everything from programmatic buying to Google AdWords to when you 
uh, buy a trip from a travel agency. You just don't do it. It's self-service. It's automated. The thing I want to really emphasize is even though your average deal size may be $10,000 or $5,000, if your smallest or, sorry, your largest client become your smallest client, that's going to change your life, right? It's going to change the company's life. And your financial part, the, your commission and your salary, it's going to change that as well enormously. So this is the thing. I want to continue. Does this sound like common sense or? Yeah. And please raise your hand. It's for your own sake because it's, this is not about information. My idea here is to give you guys transformation. And research shows that it's only 5% that you will remember. But if you do all these things, talk to each other, do the high fives, etc., you're gonna remember about 50%. So that's why I'm doing it. Anyone here heard of a guy called Chet Holmes? Charlie Munger? Same amount of people. Warren Buffett? Yeah? Coca-Cola? <laughs> so, Chet Holmes worked for Charlie Munger. He ran several divisions for Charlie and Charlie Munger is the co-chairman of Berkshire Hathaway, which, or he was, and the other co-chairman is Warren Buffett, who is one of the world's richest men, right? And they own about 15 billion, or a little bit more, worth of Coca-Cola stock. And Charlie says to Shet, I've never heard anyone double sales three years in a row. Are we either stealing, lying, or cheating? That's how good it was. And he has a model that we have refined. Here's a simplified version of it. If you have a total market, you have 100% of your market that you are addressing. Say it's the car, business to business car market. Here are everyone that can buy a car. Only 3% will be buying right now. Just a small chunk will be in the market. About 7% will be open to it. They will say, oh, not now, maybe in six months. About 30% will say, well, I haven't thought about it. I'm neutral. About 30% will say, hmm, not interested, soft no. And 30% just bought a car or something. They'll say, absolutely not. And the thing here is what most people miss is the communication is really different here than here. And marketing, who's ever heard that marketing's job is to generate leads? For salespeople, oh, not so many. I've heard it tons and tons of times. And that's, in many cases, when it's large deals, it's a mistake. Because this guy that made a $4.8 billion deal, do you think he had a problem with the leads? Was that the thing that just made it happen? No. We have a client. He had a presentation with the management team. See if I can do this. Of a very large Swedish company. Hi. And the CEO of this very large company said, hi, thank you. This was one of the best presentations I have ever heard. And he had spent about $15,000 getting help in refining this presentation. So marketing's job there was to just build trust and set the buying criteria. And what most people miss is that they haven't decided what marketing's job is here. And the other thing they haven't decided is where in this buying cycle they are going to focus. So the next exercise is this, the buying process. Where in the buying process should we focus? Early before the client is interested. Late when the client has already decided to buy. How can marketing support sales? Sales ready leads, building trust, influencing the buying criteria or something else. So turn around, give your friend a high five and start discussing for two minutes. How many is getting value so far? Anyone still think it sucks? <laughs> Same four people. So I promise you to go through the account plan, which is the key thing that gets the sales team and the marketing team together and aligned. And we have about one minute for that. And before I do that, I, I want to give you guys something. Uh, for a few people, there will be an opportunity to, that I can buy you a coaching call with me. So I pay for the call, you get it for free. 
uh, and it's going to be a 45-minute call, but there will be a few people that says, this is transformational for me. I really want to take this to the next level. And if you go into nextstate.se slash advice, you can right now book a coaching call with me. Uh, and for the few people that want to take this to the next level, you can do that. And we have about 25 seats or something like that, so it's going to fill up pretty quickly. So if you want to have a coaching call with me, please do that. And only if you're super committed to grow your business or grow the level of sales that you're doing. The final part, the problem, is the thing of the client plan, the diagnosis. It's like a broken leg and going to the doctor. And it's super important to get that right. And most people, they can't diagnose either the strategic or tactical problem. And because of that, they're solving the wrong thing for the client. And the sales and marketing team need to be aligned on this. The second thing is to know your outcome. Because if you don't know your outcome, you won't score. Very simple. The third thing is to have clear milestones. To say, okay, we're going to do this, this, and this. The fourth thing is to see where are the risks. Because most larger companies, do you think they focus on winning or not losing? Who thinks winning? Who thinks not losing? It's not losing, unfortunately. And the final part is stakeholders, to know all the stakeholders. So get this right and write down what are the three to five things that you can actually do from this session. Because if you don't do it, you won't get the results. And if you want to take your business, take your game to the next level, take action. You have to take action. So that's it for today. And I want to thank you, everyone. And Good luck with the rest of the day. So happy for you guys that you're investing your time in education. Thank you. Thank you.